to the Holy Spirit now and forever. Amen. Jesus Christ, our Lord, you are almighty and you have power over the universe. To the crowd pressing upon you, you said, Power has gone out from me. Then to the hemorrhaging woman who was healed by touching the fringe of your clothing, you said, O daughter, your faith has made you well go in peace. Now we ask you to heal us from every sin that we may stand with purity before you all the days of our lives. We raise glory and thanks to you, to your Father, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace be with the church and your children.
physician, lover of all people, we thank you for your compassion. For you have bandaged the wounds of our suffering humanity. Heal the sick and comfort the sorrowful. Receive our prayers as you accepted the plea of the hemorrhaging woman. Bless our community that prays to you. We believe that you are our Savior and our Redeemer. And we await the day of your glorious resurrection. To you be glory and thanks forever.
so that you did not suffer loss in anything because of us. For godly sorrow produces a salutary repentance without regret, but worldly sorrow produces death. For behold, what earnestness this godly sorrow has produced for you, as well as readiness for defense, and in date indignation, and fear, and yearning, and zeal, and punishment. In every way, you have shown yourselves to be innocent in this matter. Praise be to God always. synagogue came forward and he fell at the feet of Jesus and he begged him to come to his house because he had an only daughter about 12 years old and she was dying and as he went the crowds almost crushed him and the woman afflicted with hemorrhages for 12 years who had spent her entire livelihood on doctors and was unable to be cured by anyone, came up behind him and touched the tassels on his cloak. And immediately her bleeding stopped. Jesus then asked, Who has touched me? And while all were denying this, Peter said to him, Master, the crowds are pushing and pressing in upon you. But Jesus said, Someone has touched me, for I know that power has gone out from me. And when the woman realized that she had not escaped notice, she came forward trembling. And falling down before him, she explained in the presence of all the people why she had touched him and how she had been healed immediately. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you whole. Go in peace. And while he was yet speaking, someone from the synagogue official's house arrived and said, Your daughter has died. Do not trouble the rabbi any longer. 
Upon hearing this, Jesus answered him, Do not be afraid. Only have faith, and she shall be saved. And when he arrived at the house, he allowed no one to enter with him except Peter and John and James and the child's father and mother. All were weeping and mourning for her. When he said to them, Do not weep any longer, for she is not dead, but sleeping. And they mocked him, because they knew that she had died. But he took her by the hand and he called to her, Child, arise. And her breath returned and she immediately arose. He then directed that she should be given something to eat. Now her parents were astounded, and he instructed them to tell no one what had happened. This is the truth, peace be with you. and actually fosters a trust. That's why when someone's arguing, the worst thing they can do to the other person is just turn on their heels, say something as they're walking away, and then leave the room. Because you've aggravated the whole thing, including not looking them in the face speaking. It breaks the trust, breaks the communication. This has actually connected with the idea of what is a sorrow according to God and what is sorrow according to the world? In the bulletin this week, we start talking about the question of prayer. And within every human being, there is an aspect which is always transcendent. It goes beyond mere material life, what we're going to have for lunch, the bills we have to pay this week. It goes beyond this mere material things. Animals, animals are content. They are material beings, completely 100%, nothing else, just material. And they react to other 100% material things. But human beings also have an aspect which is immaterial. And that immaterial aspect of our existence transcends mere material. That is the inner aspect of the heart which in every human being drives us along for the thing that we call happiness, the contentedness, the rest, the repose, the satisfaction of our being. That's why in friendship, friendship is one of those greatest gifts because it's a relational aspect of sharing. And so it is related also, look at the person that you're speaking to. Worldly sorrow, locks us into only this world. Our disappointments, the misunderstandings, our hurts, our pains, the things that happen to us. And when we wind up comparing the two, what we're looking at is, how should we say this? The image which is you, let's go back to the scripture for one moment. We often talk about seeing the face of God or the hidden face of God. 
in the scriptures, especially in the Old Testament, especially in our Maronite prayers. And this notion of the face of God is, is God's, it indicates God's desire to communicate with us, to show that relation of communication and trust. It is hidden to us because of our sins, of original sin and our own personal sins. We are preoccupied by the things of this world. But the face of God is always desirous actually to communicate and to give to us what leads to conversion and to salvation. And again, salvation means healing. That's its fundamental meaning. Healing physically with the hemorrhaging woman, raising the daughter of Jairus from the dead. Those are physical healings, but they are salvation, and they're referred to as being salvation. But the definitive salvation, of course, is healing of the entire person, body, soul, and spirit. What I wanted to read to you this morning was that it's a part of the prayer of the morning office of this Sunday morning. It's in the Cedro. So always these long prayers for the incense ceremony. And the Cedro this morning said that we are unaware that sickness is spread in us and that the storm wrecks our thoughts and our imagination. It's quite stunning, this image. And it asks that your hope and your faith might be their healing remedy. So we ask in the Cedro, we first acknowledge, so the way the Cedros always work is we announce whatever the actual feast day is, a commemoration, or the specific grace of that Sunday. And we list them all. It's what Cedro means in Aramaic. It means ranking, listing. And what we do is we talk about what we're looking at today. And today is really the core of salvation, healing. And then we, there's basically a break in the Cedro, and it says, therefore, give us this, 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 and this. We need these things. And so in the acknowledgement in the Cedro higher up, what it's, asking, what it's saying is we are unaware. We are so confused, so dumbfounded, so disoriented that we are unaware that sickness is spread within us. We think we're great in the world, according to the world. So we are unaware of the sickness that is spread within us and that the storm, the agitation, the distractions, the things that take place around us, it wrecks our thoughts and our imagination. So when it comes to the graces that we're asking for on this day is to infuse within us your hope and your face that we might receive the healing remedy. Now, the reason why this all links with prayer is because of this aspect in human life that exceeds pure material stuff. It's why when you've lived long enough, you know that none of this stuff really holds any great satisfaction. You know that. Yes, you smile at your grandchildren when they give you yet again one more tchotchke for the shelves. You don't need them, but what you cherish is the love of course, that communicates. But you would have been just as content with the hug, really, and the slobbery kiss. The thing is there, and you like it, you remind you of that day, your birthday or whatever it was that they gave you this gift. But what you're actually cherishing is something which is also transcendent, friendship, love, family. This is what brings satisfaction to the human heart, not stuff, we know that. And because of that, <clears throat> it is indicating something that transcends even on a natural level. We're not even talking about grace yet. We're talking about just on a natural level. The satisfaction of the human heart, even on a natural level, transcends pure material things. But when it comes to the question of grace, this transcendence is now supernatural. This is not just about... <clears throat> The material things do not bring satisfaction, ultimately. They may momentarily distract us. That's the idea in the Cedro, that the storm around us wrecks our thinking and screws up our imagination. It does distract us. It draws us to it. 
because we are also part material. So material things do, they do attract us. And in themselves, there's nothing wrong with them. But they are not the reason for which we were created, which is why they always bring, finally, dissatisfaction. So on the natural level, we can already see that these things transcend, but on the supernatural level, we have to seek the face of God. We have to communicate. This is prayer. So as I mentioned in the bulletin today, grace comes to us, the gift of God comes to us through prayer and through the sacraments. Now we're not receiving the sacraments every single day, usually. And so prayer is really the only link of communication to seek the face of God that can heal the wreckage of our thoughts and our imagination, of the ability to come. And so prayer, prayer is not just something I do when I'm upset or something I do when I need something. This is often the way the world looks upon, if it looks upon prayer at all. The prayer is actually a conversation. Prayer is a communication. Prayer is a desire to seek ultimately our final end, which is the infinite good one, because he's implanted that in us. It's why the immaterial aspect of us already has something exceeding the material world, has desire that can only be satisfied ultimately in infinite goodness. So this is what St. Paul is actually touching upon when he's writing to the Corinthians in this second letter, chapter 7. And he's once again, when he's talking about Titus, this chapter 7 actually, if you read it, is linking up with a story. He starts saying something in chapter 2. But he gets derailed, as he does all the time in his letters. It's clear that when he's dictating letters, a thought comes and then that thought actually takes him off into a tangent for a while. And this is what's happened in 2 Corinthians. He started talking about Titus. He started talking about um, the relation with the Corinthians and that. And then he gets sidetracked. And he comes back now in this chapter 7 back to Titus. Because this is the thing five chapters later that he wanted to bring up. That with Titus this was good. Because what Titus did... What Titus did is Titus came and comes to him and tells him about how the Corinthians have been upset. They've heard that Paul is in prison and they're upset for him. And he says this was a consolation, not only to see Titus, the number of times he expresses his affection for Titus is quite stunning because we don't even, we're not even told about Titus in the Acts of the Apostles and all the apostolic ministries. Titus isn't even listed. Timothy's in there. But Titus isn't even in the listing. But all of a sudden, he has a letter addressed to him in the New Testament, and he becomes a great source of consolation to St. Paul. And again, the consolation is because it's a transcendent aspect of friendship. But what Titus also brings is he tells them about the Corinthians. The Corinthians have been upset. Your letters bothered them. They got agitated in the parish. But they're doing better now. And now they're actually concerned about you, not throwing rocks at you. They're concerned about you in your imprisonment. And St. Paul says, this is a great consolation. These are the gifts that come to us. These are the hugs and the slobbery kisses of life that make human life worth living. Not stuff, not bank accounts. Again, we know this. This is what St. Paul is talking about in this context, which is why it's important then to understand why all of a sudden he says, yes, and I know that the letter I wrote you caused you a lot of pain. What I had to say to you was painful. And he says, for a moment that was bothersome, but I'm not sorry that that happened. One, because it's inevitable, because of what had to be dealt with was, there were immoralities going on in the parish. But he said also, but I also see even further why I don't regret it. One, it had to be said, but the second reason why I don't regret it is it brought you to your senses. It began to heal the wreckage of your thinking and your imagination. And when he says this, then he gives the context that we quoted at the beginning of this sermon. This was a sorrow according to God. This was a sorrow of disappointment and of absence 
but of things transcendent and ultimately according to God's will. And therefore it brings about a conversion. And the conversion brings about, leads to salvation. But worldly sorrow, when we're just sad and upset, we're just locked into our worldly preoccupations, why she said this, why he did that, why I didn't get the raise, why I lost that job, why I didn't get an A on my final. All of these things are merely worldly concerns, and those that sorrow according to the world leads to death, because it locks us into that material dimension of our lives and locks us into it exclusively. And that is what brings about our addictions, our suicides, and all of the misery. It is the sad aspect in our lives. I don't know, but 30 some years ago, when I first started you know, hearing confessions and dealing with the inner workings of people's souls, children were much happier. Young people were much more carefree. A, a little too much at times, but you know, hey, it's okay. The misery, the suicides, the self-harm that goes on is unimaginable. When I worked in Geneva, I think I might have mentioned these before, or maybe during a sermon during the week. When I was living in Geneva, <clears throat> we had our cook, one of our cooks was British. And so when she would come to the Priory to cook, she always brought me the London Times. And so a few times a week I got to read the newspaper. And that was nice. But at the time, in the early 2000s, there was like this epidemic going around England of children offing themselves. Because apparently at some point, someone had made some Facebook memorial site or something for some girl at school who had died. And clearly the other teenagers thought that was really cool. But you only get it if you kill yourself. And there's a linkage, it was going around in the newspaper articles, they were, they were horrified by this thing that was going around 2009, 2010, somewhere around that period of time. Because now we all have computers in our pocket after 2007. So that becomes the big thing that focuses us and drags us, wrecks our imaginations and wrecks our thoughts. And the children are the first ones to be dragged into the abyss. It's tragic, but it is a perfect example of worldly sorrow. We're sad we lose our friend, but that's kind of her immortality, a Facebook site. And such a disorientation in thought and imagination led these other young people, not only to harm themselves, but to commit suicide. And it became this rash of suicides across England at that time. It's horrifying. But it's a perfect example of sorrow according to this world. It leads to death. So all of this is a long consideration to say, why do we pray then? We pray in order to receive, in a sense, to touch the face of God, to receive the face of God, because we have learned on our natural level that when we communicate with someone, we look at them, we speak to them, we look in their face, we look in their eyes. We see them and that trust that is founded is what prayer is. Prayer is to ultimately to be able to stand consciously, habitually, before God with the knowledge of the need of His mercy. It's a very simple idea, but to make our lives transform according to this is not easy. But it also means that the more that we stand habitually before the face of God in prayer, we also begin to see the wreckage of our thoughts and the wreckage of our imagination. And this is sad, because I'd like to think at the age of 85, or the age of 60, or the age of 45, that somehow I had it together a little bit more than I thought I did. But that illumination of grace that comes to us is actually healing us, even though the initial thing is perhaps remorse, contrition, and a sadness. But a sadness according to God leads to conversion, because our desire is to be healed. 
Remember, the hemorrhaging woman comes trembling before our Lord because she didn't get away with being hidden. And she has to enter before our Lord and look him in the face and say what she had done. Her prayer was to find just that hem, just that fringe. And our Lord makes her come out into the light. He makes her do that. He stops. He asks the question, who has touched me? And she's terrified. And it doesn't matter. He wants her in that terror to enter into this light, to see him in the face. And then when she says what she has done, our Lord calls her daughter. And he says to her, you are made whole. So go in peace. This is prayer. This is why we take seven weeks of the year to turn off all those phones that lead to suicide. In fact, just put them in a drawer for two months. You'll be much healthier for it. If your boss can't get you, well, too bad for your boss. Work it out later on face to face. We are shackled by these things and they are disorienting and destructive to our lives. They destroy faith. They destroy communication and they lock us into a material world of depression, suicide, and addiction. None of this is healthy. None of this is salvation. None of this is good. And now we've already probably lost one generation of kids. How many more generations of destruction of humanity do we have to endure before we actually come to our senses? We need to learn to pray. We need to learn to communicate face to face with the living God. And you'll notice that in the Cedro, it's not just simply the face that is being given to us of God, but also hope. It's linked with hope. So we learn to pray more deeply. We learn to pray more faithfully. And we learn to seek the face of God because our desire is to be healed, to find that salvation, and ultimately enter into the eternal communication of God that we call beatitude, that we call heaven, which is the vision of God face to face for all eternity. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.
happiness and everlasting peace to your children here before you. Make us worthy to give one another the greeting of peace with pure hearts and souls, and with the holy kiss worthy of your blessed name, that we may raise glory to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever.
for a blessed and prosperous year, for an abundant harvest, for the sick and the oppressed, for all who call upon your holy name on land, at sea, or in the air, and who profess that you are the true God, we pray to you, O Lord. Remember, O Lord, those who have presented the offering upon this altar, and those who desired to do so but were unable, and grant them their petitions. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember all the saints, the fathers, prophets, apostles, martyrs, and confessors, Mary, the mother of God, St. Joseph, St. Jude, St. Marin, St. Albert, and all the righteous and the just. Through their prayers, make us worthy to stand among them. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Be mindful, O Lord, in your grace, of those who have left us and have gone to you from the first Christian disciples to this day. They were signed with the seal of baptism and received the precious body and blood of your Son. They wait for you in your life-giving hope. Raise them up on the last day, and in your mercy forgive all their sins. Through our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, who is without sin, we hope to find mercy and forgiveness for our sins and for theirs. O 
Lord, in your grace and abundant mercy, bless those who bow before you. Make us worthy to share in your life-giving mysteries and to join the assembly of your saints, so that with them we may raise glory to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. The grace of the Most Holy Trinity, eternal and consubstantial, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. And with your spirit. Let each one of us look to God with reverence and humility and ask Him for mercy and compassion. Holy is for the holy with perfection, purity and sanctity.
Gracious God and Father, how can we repay you for your goodness and for the salvation you have just given us? Who can give you the glory you truly deserve? In our weakness, and insofar as we are able, we worship, praise, and thank you, your only Son, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Jesus Christ, our God, we worship, thank, and praise you. We implore your goodness and abundant mercy for the salvation of the whole world, for the protection of the living and eternal rest to the departed, for the feeding of the hungry and the support of the needy, for the visiting of the sick and the consolation of the grieving. Through your grace dwell in them, and by your abundant mercy give them life. By your cross bless your people and protect your inheritance. Adoration is due to you, to your Father, to your holy and life-giving Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Go in peace, my beloved brothers and sisters, with the nourishments and blessings you have received from the forgiving altar of the Lord. May the blessing of the Most Holy Trinity accompany you, the Father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the one God, to whom be glory forever. Amen.